Hi, welcome to another episode of Start the Week with Wisdom. I'm your host, Bridget Burns with the University Innovation Alliance. And I'm Doug Letterman, editor and co-founder of Inside Higher Ed. Each week, Doug and I team up to have a conversation with a sitting college president or chancellor to try and distill a sense of their perspective, their wisdom, and their leadership for you to hopefully give you a little bit of inspiration and perspective for the week ahead. So that's why we call it Start the Week with Wisdom. And Weekly Wisdom is sponsored by Mainstay, which is formerly known as Admit Hub, is what you might have known them from our, our, known them as prior. Um, and they're a student retention and engagement platform that you might know about because of chatbots, but they do other things than that. Uh, and what I like about them is that they actually engage and, and, and participate in consistent, regular, peer reviewed, published, like studied research to make sure that they validate that their work works. And two of the uh, publications that they have shared that, again, these, they work with, uh, I think, Lindsay Page on much of this is they validated that they've helped Georgia State uh, reduce their summer melt by 21 percent. And they actually helped them hang on to 1,200 additional students that they would have normally lost. Um, and so those are two studies that they've put forward. But they have a variety of others that they work with a variety of institutions. And if you want to hear more, you go to mainstay.com. So that is and today uh, we're joined by uh, President Vincent Rougeau, who's uh, from, from president of the College of the Holy Cross in Massachusetts um, and uh, spent a good part of his career uh, in legal education um, uh, and was a law dean prior to taking the uh, Holy Cross job. So welcome, Dr. Rougeau. Thank you. It's great to be with you. We're really excited to have you on. And you are the second attorney former law dean uh, that has that particular lens at looking at the work uh, in, in the last few episodes. So this is great because we're, uh, I just am super curious about the legal training and your experience leading uh, in a, like a law school and how that has just influenced or how that, how that has made it very unusual perhaps to be a president, because I think of the law as, uh, you know, clear argument, clarity, arguments, uh, facts, and then you get to make decisions based on those theoretically. But I think of the presidency as a place where, you know, I'd like to say that you get to just use the facts, but you, there's a bunch of other stuff that you have to use to make decisions. So I'm just curious about you as a leader, as you step in, uh, can you share how uh, that has affected how you lead or how it's changed how you lead? Well, sure. I mean, I think one thing that is the same is, you know, the law in theory is uh, is very clear and, and logical, but as a you know as a practical matter, it all can get really complex and confusing too. And so, uh, you know, managing a group of law professors in a law school and dealing with the issues that we we deal with in the law has a lot of com of complexity that I think becomes very relevant to any kind of leadership role you might take on. And I think right now in higher education, uh, particularly when we're thinking about uh, in my case, a liberal arts college or a university, uh, as you said, I mean, there's a lot of complexity. So I think one of the things law has helped me with uh, is understanding how to take a wide range of very complicated factual situations, details, issues, and then trying to kind of find a way through all of that, uh, you know, to lead, uh, you know, towards something specific and concrete. So um, so I think in that respect, uh, being trained in the law was really helpful. And then managing a law school, which obviously is a smaller setting than a college or university, um, was also really helpful uh, in sort of basic ways of the structure of the school mirroring in some ways uh, the structure of the college. So, um, so that was also helpful. But that being said, I think you're right. Um, the range of issues that you are confronting as uh, a college president to university president is much broader. And uh, the, the, uh, the fact that you're dealing with people who are coming to those issues from a wide variety of perspectives, not only your faculty in terms of their disciplinary perspectives, but also staff, students, alumni, uh, you know, your local community, all of these constituencies now are part of the people that you're uh, look, being looked to as a leader or who are looking to you as a leader. And that really uh, makes it a, a much more complex uh, way, to, a much more complex uh, 
charge in terms of what you have to be as, as a leader. One, one thing that you brought up that I hadn't quite thought of uh, related to the, to this set of issues is, so law schools are, are primarily, uh, they're very practically focused in terms of the outcome. Uh, you sort of know what you're aiming for. You're aiming to pr produce a, a group of graduates who can pass a bar and, and practice law. So it's, it's like a lot of graduate programs. It is uh, vocationally focused, let's say. And one of the critiques of, of uh, the liberal arts in some ways right now is perhaps not enough focus on uh, preparing people for Career. So I'm curious how you, whether whether and how you think your uh, emergence from a you know let's call it a vocational uh, discipline um, affects how you look at the role of of um, of career uh, and vocationalism at the undergraduate level for at a primarily liberal arts institution. Yeah, I think about that a lot, and it's interesting. I actually sort of think about it backwards, right? So having been in that vocational setting, you know, for lack of a better term and to keep it simple, um, I have often reflected on uh, who comes to law school, who, who is successful uh, in law school and, and can I draw any conclusions as to why? And over, you know, after being in law school for 30 years, different law schools, it was clear to me that students with strong liberal arts backgrounds tended to do really well in law school, uh, regardless of whether or not they're English majors or political science majors or psychology majors, sometimes even, you know, science majors, math majors. But there was something about the breadth and depth of liberal arts education that allowed them to take skills that they had honed uh, over four years as, you know, a, a student, despite whatever, uh, you know, major they had selected that they could at least easily transfer into, um, into law school. I mean, the kind of discipline, close reading, strong writing, all of those things. So now that I'm in the liberal arts environment, I'm thinking a lot about how do we make sure that we continue to do those things, but also recognize that it's, you know, people do wonder and families are concerned about uh, what the next step for students will be after the liberal arts. But what I can tell them honestly is, you know, there are many pathways to success with a strong liberal arts degree. And, you know, this notion that what I study as a student and as an undergraduate student necessarily has to translate, you know, very clearly to a job. It's just a, it's just a false notion in some cases. Yes, that's true. But actually we see that some of the most successful people, uh, you know, in all kinds of fields are people who had degrees that had nothing to do with what they're doing. Uh, today, well, so so like a lot of things, it presumably has um, helped you combat the temptation to view this as a binary issue uh, and to focus on the sort of messy gray of both and rather than either or. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and at least like, I think I get some credibility having been a law dean and having seen these students succeed. And I'm saying, you know, I can point to a student who you know, majored in philosophy, who's a great lawyer. I can point to a student who, you know, majored in English and who's great. They didn't know at the time that they were going to go to law school. Uh, and often there was a gap between graduating and going, but uh, they succeeded in law school based on their desire to do well and the fact that they had the skills that they needed um, that were applicable to being a good lawyer and being a good law student. Well, I uh, think that's a very timely conversation and as a liberal arts graduate uh, who had a poli sci degree, and uh, well, most people might think I uh, don't currently work, I did work in politics, but actually like all of that training and all of that learning influences everything I do as I navigate helping presidents make decisions and supporting them. There's politics in every element of what I, you know, like, so um, I just think that we have uh, too many uh, stereotypical tropes going around about the uh, English major barista that apparently one person one time ever met and we just keep passing that around. Um, and I think sharing, uh, you know, examples are, the, the counter examples are so too many. And mm -hmm. um, so I think being better at telling that story is, is probably part of it too. Um, I wanna talk about the fact that uh, you're the first lay president 
which I, I love. First off, that term immediately, I was just like, what does that mean? When I was looking at you up. But I also was just wondering, uh, an institution that has typically been led by priests, uh, you know, you are the second person we're talking to that has had that experience recently. And, and you are having to be a groundbreaker in so many different ways because you're having to teach the institution what it's like to have a leader who isn't of the same background that they're used to. And if you think about like, this is just one microcosm, but most institutions have to go through some element of this change where the leader is teaching the institution. This is how you support a leader from this background or with these additional skills. And uh, so I'm just curious about if you can share, you know, if, if you were to give advice to another institution that was gonna have a leader who is different than prior leaders, mm -hmm. uh, what, kinds of onboarding experience would you wish they had done or would you recommend they do or uh, how do you set them up so that it's not you're constantly blazing the trail yeah no it, it's an important shift and as you said i mean it happens in many other contexts in different ways but you know in our context the idea you know that had been so ingrained culturally for catholic institutions to be led by members of a religious community that founded the the school so in our case the jesuits but others, you know, have, have other communities that were in similar positions, sometimes priests, sometimes nuns. But, um, you know, I think it begins with the hiring decision and the people doing that hiring. So, you know, the board, I think, has to really understand uh, that they're making the shift and they have to, you know, be able to verbalize to all the constituencies that will be asking why it was time, why it was important, why this particular individual was the right individual in this moment. Uh, and then also to be able to talk about what changes will have to be made uh, to, to ensure or to help pave a pathway towards success. So they're, I think, sort of your first cheerleaders for the decision. Um, and usually a good board you know, represents a number of different constituencies across the community. And so you can use that, those folks to engage with different people, younger alums, older alums, you know, people in the business communities and other communities, the faculty, et cetera. Uh, I think the second piece is you're often surprised, right, at the reaction. Uh, and in my case, and I, I bet you might have heard this from other guests, uh, you know, I was really pleasantly surprised at the positivity of the reception to the change. I think a lot of people felt have been waiting for this to happen. Uh, as uh, you may know, I mean, there are 27 Jesuit universities and colleges, and four, only four of them now are, are led by Jesuits. So it's not like this came out of the blue. Now, for someone you know early on in the process, like Jack DeJoy at Georgetown, that was a bigger shock. But that's um, you know there's been some time for people to absorb it, so that's been helpful too. And then I think there was a lot of you know sort of exciting aspects to that change. You know, so people understood what it was like for a priest to lead the college and had adapted to that. And there were lots of cultural things around that that were lovely. But now having a lay person, you know, it's it's a very different experience and experience, frankly, that a lot more people in the community are, are familiar with. So, you know, I'm married, I have children, we have a house in town. Um, we can circulate in the community as, as a family and as a couple in a way that, that a priest would not be able to or would not be able to do without being seen as a priest, you know, but I can play my roles as father, as spouse, uh, you know as uh, you know, a person living in a community where I have the same needs as a homeowner as everybody else. You know? So I think that brings the college into a new kind of conversation with not only its cons normal constituencies on campus, but also with the community in which it's situated. So that's been a nice, one of the many nice changes and one of the many positive ways we've been able to use this change to you know, reimagine uh, how the presidency is seen on campus and off. And then I, I know you did. Uh, I know you've done research in your career on religion. On religion, uh, I, I'm curious, sort of what. Um, and again, thinking about this in terms of other other uh, situations like this out there, d did you find it? Um, I assume there was an. It was important to the institution that you. Um, that, that faith mattered in some way to you or that it was, so how, how did you, did you, how did you go about sort of um, either making that case or, or, or documenting that for them and, and making sure it was what you wanted yourself as well? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Well, as you said, I mean, I had a, I had a, a body of academic work that showed that I had, you know, those, some of those commitments in terms of my intellectual uh, engagements 
Uh, but, you know, my personal life obviously was another way for me to demonstrate that. But I think more importantly in my case is I had always worked at institutions that were um, faith-based. In this case, they were all Catholic institutions and uh, different kinds, you know, most, you know, two Jesuit institutions, one uh, non-Jesuit, but uh, well-known Notre Dame. Um, so, uh, and one, you know, research, big research institutions. So I had this variety of engagement with Catholic higher education over the course of my career, which, you know, made it pretty obvious to people that, you know, my commitments to the mission of Catholic higher ed were, you know, kind of pretty much lived out in everything that I had done. Um, and at the same time, uh, you know, my personal uh, education had not been in those settings. You know, I, I went to secular uh, schools for college and law school, you know, and so I was able to kind of to bring my perspective, having been educated in one environment to the fact that I spent my career in another one. And I think that that was actually a real strength in terms of thinking about how do we take the best of what we do in higher education in this country and then combine it with the distinctive mission we have uh, as in this case, you know, Jesuit Catholic institutions, you know, what are we adding uh, to the conversation? What are we adding to what higher education can be in this country and in the world because of who we are? And it was easy for me to articulate those things because that's had been my entire life experience and professional experience. So I want to shift to talking about you as a leader, and uh, I'm sure that there are a multitude of things and, and examples uh, uh, that have contributed to your idea of what leading looks like. And I am curious about, um, have you learned more from good examples of what you'd like to emulate or bad examples that you'd like to avoid? And if you could share kind of where your idea of leadership has been most strongly informed. Yeah, that's a great question because it's not an easy one. I, you know, I think you learn from both good, positive, and negative examples. And I think, in a way, the negative examples in my case have been particularly powerful, not because I haven't had a lot of positive ones, but I think as a leader, you can't really completely copy another leader to be good, right? There's a certain, uh, mandate in a sense i think to be a good leader that you kind of go deeply inside yourself and be and be very authentic as a leader so in in your quest for authenticity if you really are thinking honestly and seriously about who you are it's hard to become someone else and then be successful as leader but what you can do is you can draw obviously from those positive examples and build something that is you know compatible with the person that you are so um you know, I, I have some great, I, you know, I think my earliest, earliest examples of, of leadership came from my father, who, you know, did some things that were, um, that I don't know if I could have done uh, in terms of being so devoted to principles that he had to make some really serious sacrifices in his life to, um, you know, achieve things that ended up, you know, being of huge benefit to many people beyond him. Uh, so, you know, he was involved in the civil rights movement and, you know, was, uh, you know, jailed for some of the work that he did there. And, you know, so I'm always deeply moved and very proud of, of the sacrifices he made to lead in that way. And so, of course, that had a huge impact on me growing up. But uh, beyond that, he, you know, as he took other jobs, I noticed how he was always very driven by a sense of mission and a sense of justice and a sense of, you know, being there for others. So the big lesson I took from him in that is that if you're leading to, you know, primarily because you need to give, get something for yourself uh, because you're trying to, you know, grab some brass ring or prove something to others, um, you know, that may not be the best motivation, at least in my mind. I don't think that's the best motivation for a leader. If you're leading, however, because you are moved to, you know, improve an organization or an institution or or or, or a city uh, on behalf of many of the many. If you you know you you have a skill or a talent or a vocation that can really uh, be a gift to other people and, and improve lives of, for other people or can make an institution better, then that's that's what motivates me, and that's what because that's what I saw in him. Um, and you know, it's not to put yourself on a pedestal. It's not to say that you're going to be perfect because your motivation is good. It's just to say that at the end of the day, I think people who are leading 
in a sort of servant leadership style or an other focus style, you know, can be, uh, are just going to be more successful. Everyone's going to make mistakes, but it's a lot easier to move through those mistakes when people at base see that your leadership is about uh, someone beyond yourself. That's great. And I love that that gives us a sense of kind of your style as a leader. Um, uh, where does, um, uh, what have you been, where did you learn? I guess, I guess you've already sort of answered partly this question, but um, where is there a single experience or action uh, that you are most proud of as a leader so far, either so far in your presidency or, or earlier? Well, um, I think it's probably early in my presidency to, to find one, but I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that there will be some, some successes. But I, when I look back at my deanship, I guess, at Boston College, I see I'm really proud of what we were able to do in terms of moving the institution forward in a, from a time where when I arrived, I thought you know, there was a lot of disenchantment on the faculty. There was a lot of disenchantment amongst the alumni for all kinds of reasons I won't go into, but um, I just remember being uh, the brunt of many emails and phone calls about things that you know I had no involvement in, but that were troubling a lot of people and they were expecting some real movement and action. <laughs> and so, uh, so I really had to think carefully about what was really um, at issue in this community, what was sort of the, the core of the distress. It was being manifested in different ways. People wanted the rankings to be higher. They wanted uh, better relationships with the bar. They, I mean, there were all kinds of things going on. But I think what really was needed was a kind of uh, the, a coming together of the particular the faculty around a vision for the future of the school, which really centered things that were important. And also a vision from the university about, you know, the, the university's mission and values that was very consistent with the law school um, and what the law school did, but had not been communicated well between the two entities. So I was really, I think, I think I was able to really, one, bring the law school and the university back together in a really positive uh, relationship, which had broken down quite a bit uh, prior to my time there and uh, to really move to a place where now the, the law school faculty are really excited about their relationship with the university and what they can do going forward um and it was able to we were able to move the the law school up uh in its uh in its rankings and i don't want to overemphasize that but i just i think it was just a positive moment for everyone to see the school move back into a ranking space where everyone felt much more proud of, of that indicator and um, you know, we we became a more diverse law school. We uh, saw extraordinary success in our bar passage rates. We saw a lot of great things happen. So I'm really pr proud that I was able to leave Boston College Law School in a place that uh, I felt was an excellent place, that, and I was able to bring that community together uh, in the way I was talking about earlier. I mean, it wasn't about me. It was about how do I get this community to feel proud of what it's doing and to feel excited about its future in a way that will allow me to step away and for that momentum to continue, which I know it will. That's great. I mean, I think that's what everyone, you know, we expect that the wins will be something that's so visible, like there's a cannon and there's confetti and whatever, but it just leaving a place better than you found it and right. actually doing the things when you're asked to do, frankly, most of the time, oppositional things, yes. contradictory things, and that you're still able to have accomplished that and to not do it, uh, worried about who gets the credit, but actually building a community around that. That sounds like a massive success story. Um, so I'm sure that was incredibly difficult, but that's, uh, that's great. Um, I mean, no, <laughs> I <got it>. <laughs> <laughs> from afar. Um, so I, what I want to understand is uh, I'm curious about the advice that has been most useful for you. And I'm curious about the advice that you find yourself giving others. And I also wanna say that when we had our first conversation, I was like, man, your voice, you should be on radio. If your institution does not have a podcast because you have like the best presidential voice. Uh, so I'm looking forward to you telling us your advice. And I think that we're gonna cut that clip and then people will be like, man, who's that guy? He's, he's an incredible <laughs> podcast. So uh, just uh, flagging you, yeah. I, I just want you to keep talking. Well, thanks. Now I have, well, I guess I have to thank uh, whatever the genetic uh, gift I got for having great, plus B 
being a singer over many years taught me a lot about how to how to speak in a way that that enhances your voice and how you sound. So, well, so that would thank help. you. Uh, but um, yeah, the advice. Uh, well, I think I touched on it earlier, and I think one of one thing that I'm always telling people is you need to be you need to be your authentic self. You need to take this job recognizing that you know the person that you are is going to be critical to the culture that you will create um, in the institution that you lead. And uh, so, you know, don't, as I said before, you cannot go into this thinking that, oh, I'm going to become this so that I can succeed as a leader. If you think you have to transform yourself to do this, uh, you know, you're, you're setting yourself up for, for failure. But if you feel that the person that you are and the, and the things that motivate you are going to allow you to, to be a transformational leader or a successful leader, then great, then, then move forward. So that's the first bit of advice. The second bit of advice that I always give is it is not something you can do alone. The most important thing that you will do as a leader is to build a great team of people around you to help you lead. Uh, it is a team sport these days. Uh, and the vision of a leader from earlier times where, you know, just the power of a personality transforms an institution. I'm not saying that can't happen, but the examples that I see of that are, are, are slim, uh, you know, these days. What I have found successful in my leadership uh, is to really draw on the, an extraordinary group, a diverse group of people who bring different strengths and talents to, to the table and then to really allow those talents to shine. And then, you know, my role as leader is to listen and engage and, you know, be in conversation with these folks. And then yes, draw from that and make decisions uh, as the leader, uh, you know, having, you know, taken advantage of the wisdom of my team. So if you don't like working in teams, if you don't like giving other people credit, if you don't like, uh, you know, if you think everyone who works around you should be like you, I don't think you're going to have a very successful uh, uh, term as a leader. But if you really enjoy, you know, bringing together people who can of talent, who uh, who respect one another and respect you, and want to also move the the institution in a new direction or uh, a successful direction, then I think uh, you can be a successful leader. That's great. Um, so the last question I have is: if there's been a book. Uh, that has been most formative for you in your leadership journey? Or do you find yourself, you know, I'm sure lots of people ask you to mentor them. And I'm guessing that you at some point make a recommendation. You should read X. And I'm just wondering, what is the book that you most frequently are suggesting for people? Well, um, my wife suggested a book to me uh, during my deanship at BC that I think is great. And that's uh, Nancy Cohn's Forged in Crisis. Uh, I think Nancy Cohn is a professor at Harvard Business School, and she profiles five historic leaders from history, you know, from uh, uh, Rachel Carson to you know, Abraham Lincoln to uh, Shackleton, the Arctic explorer, and you know, develops, you know, tells stories about critical points in their in their lives or in their times as leaders that you know really reveal something important about leadership in their case and things that are important for all leaders. And I found that really helpful. So I often recommend that. The other one, I, the other thing I, I've learned a lot from is just looking at historical leaders. So uh, there's a Harry, T. Harry Williams wrote a book, um, Lincoln and His Generals. And um, I found that to actually, and that was given to me, believe it or not, by one of my faculty members at BC, like within days of my arrival. <laughs> and I thought, well, okay, well, I'll read this and see. But uh, I will always thank her for it because it really, it really taught me a lot. And then I just think reading about other historical figures. I, I read a great book about Benjamin Rush that has offered me a lot as well. One of the, uh, you know, the, the framers and founders that you don't hear so much about, I think, are the ones that are actually particularly interesting. Uh, so um, I think uh, th those are three examples of books that have really meant a lot to me. Those are great. Uh, well, thank you for sharing those with our audience. And uh, we're really delighted to be able to, to showcase you and to draw a little attention to your leadership. And it's been really nice to get to know uh, your perspective. And also, again, like I said, you have the most phenomenal presidential voice. I'm like, I, I'm kind of like, the, I'm assuming that when if you get angry ever, uh, you probably don't even raise it. It just seems like you'd probably be very calm, even in the midst of your frustration. <laughs> 
No, my children can tell the difference in tone. That's what they say. You don't <laughs> yell, but you're using that other voice. Yeah. <laughs> or you call them their other name, their actual <laughs> name, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Good. So, so it's good to know that's, that's consistent. All right. Well, uh, we really appreciate you spending the time with us today. It's been a wonderful time getting to know you. And Doug, as always, thanks for being an excellent co-host. I'll see you all next week. Thank you. Great to be with you.